In conversation with the Han Su Yin archive and the works of Jean Claire D. and Sim Chi Yin, this archival selection presents material from two books about Sino Philippine diplomatic relations in the 1970s. The first book, Ten Days in September, Imelda Romualdez Marcos in China, published by the Department of Public Information and the National Media Production Center in 1974, covers First Lady Imelda Marcos's visit to the state in September 1974. Upon invitation of then Premier Cho Enlai, Imelda spent 10 days in China and visited Peking in September 20 to 23, Tientsin on the 24th, Hangzhou on the 25th, Yan'an on the 26th, and Shanghai from the 27th to the 29th. Reporters covering the visit have noted how Imelda was, and I quote, received more attentively than most visiting heads of state. In her interviews about the visit, she cites her friendship with Xiang Qing, wife of Mao, as an important factor in this hospitality. She identifies their shared quote-unquote orientalness and what she considers the loneliness of being first ladies and not being valued for their own right as sources of sympathy. Chiang reorganized Imelda's itinerary and became her tour guide. The two women bonded over conversations about U.S.-China politics from Nixon to the Watergate affair to discussing the film Gone with the Wind. Although by the end of the trip, Imelda was not, and I quote, converted to the Chinese worldview, she expressed admiration for China, saying, you cannot imagine how awesome China is, so nearby, so dedicated, so one-track mind. Co-written by Lt. Col. Santiago H. Medrana Jr. and Capt. Horacio D. Puno, the second book titled People's Republic of China, Philippine Relations and the Local Chinese Community, was published by Medrana's Press in 1975. As its title suggests, the book discusses the relationship between the People's Republic of China and the Philippines, particularly the Chinese community in the Philippines. The book's jump-off point is an earnest belief that the Philippines is, and I quote, at the center of the international activities merging the East and the West, end of quote, and that, among other things, it prefers confluence rather than non-alignment. And I quote, bringing the good features of each superpower, that is, Russia, United States, and China, to all, end of quote. This confluence would be cultivated by the establishment of a World University of the Philippines, which will, and I quote, bring the east-west center closer to the mainland and harmonize communism and democracy, end of quote. In June 1975, President Ferdinand Marcos and Imelda, along with their daughters and two Filipino reporters, went back to Peking for a five-day state visit to discuss with Mao Zedong the diplomatic relationship between the two states. In a dinner organized for the Marcoses, then Chinese Deputy Premier Deng Xiaoping delivered a speech about China's position of quote-unquote non-interference particularly in the preferred social systems of other nations. In his speech, Deng proclaimed that, and I quote, China will never be a superpower and will never commit aggression. Also reproduced in this showcase is a copy of a survey questionnaire from the Medrana and Puno volume prepared by the University of the Philippines College of Public Administration. The survey looks into, and I quote, the opinions and attitudes of the Chinese community in the Philippines towards the proposal to open diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China. The China trips pursued what Foreign Affairs Undersecretary Manuel Coliantes identified as, quote, diplomacy for development, unquote wherein diplomatic decisions were dictated by economic considerations rather than ideological orientations. 
alongside its active participation in programs initiated by the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, the Marcos government inaugurated diplomatic relations with communist nation states. This started as early as 1972, the same year Marcos declared martial law in the Philippines, with the formalization of the diplomatic ties between the Philippines and Yugoslavia and the Philippines and Romania. After China, diplomatic relations were established with the Soviet Union, Algeria, Cuba, Libya, and the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, all in 1976. This trajectory was shaped by, quote, self-determination and self-reliance, unquote. As Marcos explains in 1976, the first and the most fundamental of these stressed the supremacy of national interest in the conduct of foreign affairs. Second, we stressed the need for flexibility and pragmatism in our diplomacy to encompass not merely our hopes for peace and security, but our very aspirations to development. And third, we stress the need for contacts with all nations desiring our friendship on the basis of mutual respect and mutual benefit. According to historian Archie Rezos, this stance was the first time in Philippine history wherein foreign policy deviated from alignments with the United States and its democratic allies. Hi, I'm Jean Claire D. Um, I'm a Filipino Chinese filmmaker, writer, and media artist from Davao City in Mindanao, Philippines. That's the south of the Philippines. And I'm one of the artists participating in the exhibition Cast But One Shadow at UP Vargas Museum, which opens on September 24, 2021. First of all, I am grateful to the curators of the exhibition, Carlos Quijon and Kathleen Witzig, for including me in this exhibition. It's such an honor. Um, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we can't be in one physical space, hence this recorded um, video. So why did I join this exhibition? Um, when Carlos um, Quijon uh, messaged me that he wanted me to be part of the exhibition as he is the Filipino curator of the exhibit um, of the Philippine um, leg. Um, I asked what was it about and he sort of summarized the whole thing that um, the theme of the exhibition is to explore racial presence, anti-colonial struggle, and interventive ways of um, navigating colonial and neo-colonial relations through uh, throughout Southeast Asia. And I have always been interested in this thread of inquiry for a while, and so I agreed to participate. And it is also a good opportunity for me to be part of an exhibition that's participated by um, artists, that by international artists. So... As a Filipino Chinese, one of my preoccupations in my work is to explore my hybrid identity. So in 2016, I created an experimental essay film that problematizes my experience in making sense of my roots. Um, and Carlos knew about this, so he thought of encouraging me to explore this identity. Um, Perhaps because, of course, um, the Philippines is part of, you know, the proxy war uh, in during the Cold War period. So, um, just to give you a little history about myself, because I was trying to like problematize my hybrid identity. At some point, I lived in China for a few years. And that's where I tried to look for my roots. I found, I tried to find my ancestors, but unfortunately I wasn't able to because when I went to Xiamen, I literally found an SM 
mall in the place where supposedly my relatives were living of course i didn't really know the exact details um those information about them was just passed on to me by my my aunties um anyway so i tried to learn the language i learned so many things and i kind of appreciated that part of me that i didn't get to appreciate when i was growing up because um you know being a hybrid um person i mean i'm third generation but like um i was more in tune with this filipinoness that's supposed to be imposed uh, within me which is also a very uh problematic complicated idea because what is filipino but anyway so um the idea of my piece uh well my piece is in is an is a sound and video installation entitled waves of time and sea and carlos kihon uh, encouraged me to read the ties that bind um it's really an interesting book because um and it was also serendipitous because when he uh, encouraged me to read the book i just came back from a trip to tawi-tawi um in the southern part of the philippines it's one of the most beautiful places in the philippines that's often you know considered as um conflict ridden because of some you know past news about it but it's so beautiful so i went there it's so peaceful and i found out that there were also sama um sama chinese uh, sama is the the indigenous group there that um, lives in tawi-tawi and then i found out that there were actually more um muslim chinese in the sulu area of of the Philippines, Sulu is an island, and um, and so that interested me. So when um, Carlos Quijón uh, told me to read the book, and I remember my sister also, who's a, who's an heritage expert, told me about the book. The book. I became more interested. So the ties that find um, really chronicles the, the history of of the friendship between Sulu and China. So. Apparently, in during the 14th century, the Qing Dynasty, um, wh- one of the sultans of Sulu was friends with the the emperor, and at some point he was invited to go to China. So he traveled all the way to China, but he wasn't able to go back to the, or return to the Philippines or to Sulu at that time um, because he fell sick. And so he died in 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 China, and the emperor, being a friend, actually built a temple or a monument for him there. Um, and then recently, um, with the ties that bind um, the Philippine and Chinese association association in the Philippines, traced uh, that story, and they came up. They built also a monument in Sulu to commemorate or remember. The Sultan. Um, interestingly, there there are actually um, descendants of of the Sulu or the Sultan from Sulu in China now, and they're also practicing um, Muslim Chinese. This is actually very interesting, considering that when I was talking to um, a Chinese artist uh, recently about my work, she said that. That's actually um, an interesting aspect, considering that um, China right now is experiencing a lot of um, criticism uh, of its treatment of the Uyghur um, Muslims in the area with the concentration camps and so on. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to go to those camps when I was touring around China when I lived there, but I met some Uyghur, Uyghur um, Chinese uh, Muslims in in those areas, in those remote areas that I went to. So anyway, um, that book uh, served as a jump-off point um, for my piece. Um, 
so it's not the piece is not really a documentary of the the historical um, story of the book um, the book I just use as an inspiration to explore more the affinities between the historical affinities between um, China and Sulu and vis-a-vis -vis Philippines and China um, so uh, just to like give you a, a short um, background um, during the Qing dynasty as I mentioned the Emperor of China and the Muslim Sultan of Sulu were really close friends and at some point in history Sultan Paduka decided to journey to China and visited and he died there and accidentally um, died there so the Emperor made a tomb as I mentioned but um, uh, so in the book actually there is a discussion also of how at some point the Sultan of Sulu asked China to to annex them to China they actually asked for annexation because they were they would rather be annexed to China uh, instead of being colonized by other other parties so they 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 there was an exchange of letters and um, one of those letters um, answering um, the letters from the Sultan is uh, was printed in the book and there is a copy of the Qing Emperor Qianlong's reply to the Sulu Sultan Muhammad Ali Muddin's uh, request found in the document 476 of veritable records of the Qing dynasty and the scroll with the imperial edict of em Emperor Yongle edifying the Sultan of Sulu who died in Shandong so it's really interesting the book actually has like archival materials of those letters not just the uh, not just the request for annexation but like letters of friendship and edifying the the Sultan of Sulu so um, it looks like these two rulers might have looked at each other as equals and friends at that time different from the geopolitics of the Cold War and the contemporary times now. We all know that um, the geopolitics has changed in contemporary times. So, I thought about it and I thought about what kind of iconography I can use for my piece. And I remember the most ubiquitous um, object in most Chinatowns around the world, including the Philippines and even in China. And it's the figurine of the cat waving, which is also ironic because it's actually um, Japanese in origin and it was, it was co-opted by the Chinese. So now you could actually see or you could actually you actually think that it's Chinese but it's actually Japanese in origin which is another layer of that history of uh, of connection so anyway um, so it's the cats waving and what they did was to also record uh, the, the sound of a man reciting the archive letters uh, from the, the Chinese Emperor and um, and Every time the, the cat waves, the, the, the sound plays at different speeds. And it's sort of like um, a harmonic choir of voices speaking in Mandarin. So for me, the figurine of a waving cat is ubiquitous image and used in most Filipino Chinese stores and households because they're supposed to be good luck charms. Um, if you notice, if you look at the, the figurines, there's actually a, a, a Chinese characters uh, in the base that says good luck or something that, like that. But I also see they're waving us, both waving farewell and saying hello. So identities for me is always in transit the Chinese in the Philippines much like in China 
where I once lived were also itinerant, moving from one place to place to another because of business opportunities. And one is rooted to a place but at the same time not rooted to it because of intergenerational migration. So, so some of the iconography that can also be seen in the video uh, that is displayed along with the cats um, also play with this um, idea of, of identities in flocks, uh, in flocks in relation to the, the connection between China and the Philippines. And it's also my interpretation of how I experienced um, China as a Filipino Chinese and how I experienced um, the Philippines, uh, China, most Chinatowns, or even the Philippines in regular places as a, a Filipino Chinese with a Chinese surname. Um, so the installation would look like something in, in a storefront in, in most Chinatowns where you have a waving figure, a figuring cat um, waving and and that that somehow that's something that I wanted to play with which is more like popular and also like um, using popular iconography but at the same time also using archival footage which is actually uh, a meeting of the past and 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 the present but the cats can also be seen as an iconography of capitalism. The cats in China are used to welcome customers to come in and buy something. I use them as a way to play with those ideas and concepts and also as a way of recognizing economic influences of China with its neighbors, sometimes are con that are considered harmful. So they say China has its own brand of imperialism at present. What with the dispute between the West Philippine Sea and how um, its investments and the pressure it creates in countries like the Philippines is very apparent. So that's a reality that, um, that we have to face, that I had to face, and I also considered when making the peace. I see these realities as well, and I don't gloss over that reality. Um, but the peace should not be taken as a celebration of these capitalistic tendencies and realities. Um, it somehow also kind of like um, plays with the idea that the irony that when I was living in China, uh, communism. It's, it's a, such a far away concept because if you look around, people are living in like any other um, country that's based on capitalism. But then, of course, you could see that the state is um, functioning in such a way that it's controlled by the Com Communist Party. But at the same time, I feel that my understanding of these realities can also be explored through recognizing that histories that there are histories that are not often talked about especially in the in the philippines where there is actually a real historical affinity between sulu um sulu that's muslim dominated and and china and those affinities should also be um recognized if we could understand if we wanted to understand this connection between with between China and the Philippines. The sound you hear of the Chinese man speaking and his words are disjointed and are based on the archival letters of the emperor to uh, to the Sultan of uh, the Sulu Sultanate is meant to be broken just to signal the misconception that happened or just to signal sorry the miscommunication that happened across time and see so this is um the miscommunication that happens through long periods of time and the distance um that separates these two um areas uh, uh, sulu and china vis-a-vis -vis philippines and china 
Um, so those are the layers. I don't want to explain so much uh, about my piece. Uh, in any case, you can interpret the work however you want, but that's basically um, the, the, the reference or the context of how I decided to make this piece and how I used um, those very popular iconography. So I hope you enjoy my work and the rest of the exhibit and glean some insights from, from it and from the other works as well. Thank you very much and good day.